Hello and welcome to Cyberdeck Users Weekly. I have a very special guest today. His name is Jeremy Solar. Hello, Jeremy. Hi, how's it going? Good. Uh, so you are the... I mean, first off, thank you so much for being here. I'm very mm-hmm. excited to talk to you. Glad to be here. Uh, you are the the benevolent, benevolent dictator for life of Redox OS and um, a principal engineer at System76. Uh, what, 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 what do those two terms mean? Well, uh, I created the Redox project in 2015, and uh, I intend to, to control its direction. And if you don't like that, you can fork it, which is, <laughs> it's, that's the beauty of open source. So uh, I think it's a, a model that works really well with a lot of other open source projects uh, to have one person who makes the decision of what ends up in the master branch of all of the related projects of Redox. And it is open source, so I expect there to be distributions and deviations from what is the official upstream version of Redox. Mm. At System76, my role is to is to support the hardware that we sell, uh, and that's through a whole bunch of different fronts. That's through firmware development, that's through hardware development, uh, both electrical engineering and mechanical engineering, and that's through software development and through our operating system, Pop! OS. So those are kind of the, the four different things that I look at at System76. And thankfully, they all kind of tie together because uh, for Redox, I do a lot of low-level development, and that informs my work at System76 and vice versa. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of hardware available at System76, and that I can use to improve Redox. And I've used Rust on, on both extensively. Obviously, Redox OS is, its entire purpose is to be primarily written in a, in a language such as Rust uh, that has safety guarantees, and that's all the way from the kernel up. And at System76, we, we use Rust all over the place in firmware, in Pop! OS, um, in driver support, everywhere. Yeah, you, you mentioned that your work um, on, on both things and forming the other, and I'm really interested, how did, how did you even get... Um, your foot in the door with this sort of low level programming. My, my history, I started out with Dreamweaver, right? So I feel like mm. over the years, very slowly have slowly sunk below the front end into slightly lower levels. But there, there's something still very intimidating about, about registers and assembly and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think it, I think it can be very difficult to get into. And uh, I was lucky that I was given some really low performance computers to start with. Uh, my first computer was a $25 laptop and that was 20 years ago. So you can imagine <laughs> it was, it was a, already a 10 year old laptop 20 years ago. So you can imagine how terrible that was. Uh, but uh, it, it ran Windows 3.1 okay. poorly and I replaced it with DOS and that was really the reason why I got into doing assembly is I had to do a lot of things in assembly um, just to work on the machine. And I was very interested in, in how computers worked uh, at a more atomic level. Not really the, the big picture things, but how did those little tiny operations that a processor, how, how did those add up to the big picture things? So I've, Redox is not the first operating system or kernel that I've worked on. Um, the first operating system I ever wrote, uh, it was all 32-bit assembler. And it was, um, it could load ELF files, it had a C library, but everything was written in assembler. And uh, I don't know, I guess, if you're really attracted to assembly language, I think that indicates that that low level things are going to be easy for you. And I, I do think that's the biggest barrier is to learn how assembly language works and how how a processor works on a 
per cycle kind of view of the processor. And from there, you build it out to so many abstractions above that um, in kernels and in programs and in the final user experience. But um, I think people are lucky to start at one of those ends of the spectrum and work from there. I, I think if you are interested in, in the user experience and, and what happens when, well, in, um, in kind of the final product that the user gets, I think it's very hard to drive much of that from the low level. But at the same time, none of that's possible without the low level. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm working on like a, uh, a UI toolkit in Rust right now. And, mm -hmm. and, and I feel like that's very inspired by when you are floating up at the high level, you're like, ah, there are so many layers of abstraction and some of them aren't good anymore. There are, or they, right. they, don't, they don't, at least they don't feel like they're good or they don't, this seal feels like it's slower than the hardware is, you know, and, and mm -hmm. it's, so you're, you're tempted to go down, but you know, when you start digging in, you're like, well, how deep do you want to dig to, to actually improve user experience, you know, and you, you yeah. have to throw away so many of the abstractions that have been made at, at the user level that it takes a long time to get all the way back to something usable. Yeah, and there are lots of really great examples of, of this problem happening over and over and over. And not just in, in free software. That's the easiest way to, to inspect it. But if you, like if you look at a modern Linux operating system and you, you look at how long the Linux kernel and X11 and the GNU user space have stayed around, these items have stayed around because they've done their section of the, the low to high level you know, set of components really well, well enough that trying to replace them has become incredibly difficult. And Redox is in some ways an attempt to replace the whole stack with, a way, with using Rust as the central language. And it's a very difficult thing to do. Things that you would never imagine being problems um, blow up in your face. Like you'd think translation was really simple or text formatting or the way in which characters are printed on a screen. But the more you get into internationalization, you realize that by itself is way more work than all the drivers you could ever create in the entire world. <laughs> and so... Um, to actually put pixels on a screen uh, in terms of making a new operating system, that was actually done in day one with Redox OS. Mm -hmm. But then all the other stuff is kind of all the other time that we've had to account for from 2015 to now. And, and so w would you say that's one of the big reasons that these pieces uh, don't get replaced um, the, uh, up and down the tech stack is that they have added all the edge cases? Absolutely. That's a great way to say it is, uh, you know, you can, you can think of the simplest way and you can think, well, if all I want to do is let's, let's name a, a random user and that user just wants to push 3d graphics to the display as quickly as possible. Uh, they want to play Minecraft as quickly as possible. So you can design an operating system that optimizes that case. And you can say, well, we're going to take the touchpad input, we're going to drive it straight through the kernel, straight to the Minecraft process, and we'll have really low latency input. But then you ask the question, well, how are you going to calibrate the touchpad? Well, we want that calibration to happen outside of the kernel in user space. How are you going to allow for different keyboard mappings? How are you going to handle uh, hardware that has different display DPIs? And on and on and on. And these things aren't relevant at all when you're thinking about just a, a single-use computer, but they end up being relevant for a general-purpose operating system. Thankfully, we've worked through so many of these problems in, in open source already with with. Linux and, and all the various Linux distributions out there. Um, un unthankfully, it's all written in C, and uh, it's, all, it's all prone to certain problems that I want to 
not introduce into Redox. Mm-hmm. Well, I know a lot of uh, developers who advocate heavily for Rust. Let's say, um, uh, even you know, even ones who are coming from C and C plus plus background, talk about how Rust can create uh, much safer abstractions, especially between libraries, um, be- because of the the protections that it, it offers and the, the the safety. Like I'm, I've never written C, but I understand you have to manage memory yourself. <laughs> Um, mm-hmm. and that can, that can get pretty hairy, especially when you're working with libraries and stuff. Um, so is there, there a potential for some of this work to become much more reusable, um, and more modular possibly as it is written in Rust? Absolutely. And that's something that I've noticed is I will write a component for Redox, which is, you know, this general purpose microkernel. And I will use that component in Linux and even inside of firmware. So the font rendering in Redox, which is done by a library called Rust Type, mm-hmm. that font rendering is reused inside of the System76 firmware. And that firmware is a completely different environment. One where, um, one where it's all monolithic, all compiled together as a single executable, there's no memory protection whatsoever in terms of like virtual memory that an operating system would have. And yet I'm able to reuse all of these components I wrote for Redox. And I'm able to spin up firmware applications much faster than people who are, are people who are um, longstanding in the industry. They, uh, Intel engineers were impressed with our firmware menu because they hadn't seen anything done so quickly and, and so elegantly. But to write one component and be able to cross-compile it and be able to integrate it into completely different applications uh, and have the compiler kind of walk you through the whole process is, I think, the biggest thing I get out of, of Rust, just the speed of development. Could, could you imagine a world... This is a little more fanciful, but like a... Um... Like, you know, like an old video game console, right, didn't really have much of an operating system, at least the way I would think of, right. of an operating system. You kind of would boot to the game. Um, mm-hmm. Could you imagine a little bit more of that? Like, I've got a, a Raspberry Pi 4, and and someone ships me his game on a USB stick, and I plug it in to the, the Pi 4, and it just boots to that game or, or that application like where you'd really actually, because you can use these libraries uh, and I guess the touchpad configurator is a, is a library somehow. Um, is that, is that a possible path forward? Uh, I, I don't think so exactly. And uh, I think, yes, the, the, uh, the way consoles have worked is that the game was basically the operating system. The game would handle all the input and all the hardware devices and all the memory of the device. But I think there are very few use cases where you don't want to include two unrelated pieces of software on one machine. And that the most efficient way to do that is with, with a... With uh, user mode programs, not with virtual machines, not with running on bare metal, but with a kernel that manages programs and keeps them separate using virtual memory. That is the, the most efficient way to run more than one piece of independent software on, on one machine. And I think that's the majority of use case. Yes, I, I get what you're saying with if the Raspberry Pi, if you want to maximize performance of one application, Building a unikernel that just was that application is certainly something that we're seeing more of these days. And that happens in the server world too. But in the server world, they then slam that unikernel into a into a virtual machine manager. And that just adds more overhead on top of it in terms of memory and CPU overhead. So when you say efficiency, you're talking like actual performance efficiency? Uh, I'm really talking about how many how many instructions per second can you get out of a program hmm. and what is its RAM footprint and things like that. And the more components you can reuse and the more the more processes you can run at the same time, 
the less memory you have to use for the entire system put together. Uh, I think the problem with the systems we have right now is we've tried to include all the drivers in the kernel such that what we see in the server world, especially where they really are, every single server you spin up is a cost of business quite a lot. So they're looking at what, what amount of server do they need per user using their service. Like if you look at Netflix and, and they're streaming to 20,000 users concurrently, they're trying to figure out the minimum number of servers that they can pay for to support that load. And I think that if you have a unikernel, you will always end up having more memory being used than if you have a microkernel, a properly designed microkernel. And the same thing with a monolithic kernel. Uh, a monolithic kernel, what ends up happening with Linux is you, you boot Linux on a server machine and then you start up a VM to, to split it up into different additional Linux instances. And um, the overhead of that can be quite significant. So unikernels are an attempt to fix that by, by not having to spin up Linux for every single application. But you still have to use a virtual memory manager. I think the best possible way to virtualize is using